Relations between the U.S. and China in recent years have focused primarily on one thing, the economy. But both countries have agreed to expand high-level talks to include issues of strategic importance. China's military buildup, North Korea, Taiwan, and climate change are now all on the agenda. China wants to avoid real security crises. On the other hand, it also, I think, does aspire to be a great power in a very full way. How will dialogue between the U.S. and China shape the coming decade? Next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. And now from our studios, here is Ralph Begleiter. Welcome to Great Decisions. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Joining us to discuss U.S.-China relations and the rise of China's military are David Lampton, Dean of Faculty and Director of the China Studies Program at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University, and Randall Shriver, a founding partner at Armitage International and a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Welcome to you both. Good to be with you. You know, it seems like every president since Richard Nixon, and perhaps even ones before that, have struggled with the Chinese-American relationship. It's just a tough one to deal with, and often it comes up very early in the administrations. Why is that the case? Randy, what makes it such a big, uh, contentious relationship? Well, I think it relates to the uncertainty of China's trajectory. Uh, questions still remain, ultimately, will China be more friend and ally or more... Uh, adversary and, and some of those questions are just not answerable. And I think secondly it relates to the complexity of the relationship. There's, there's so much to it. So there are positive aspects. The trade and the economics are often viewed as more positive and then there are some uh, more challenging issues. Security, human rights, nonproliferation. So I think it's, it's those two pillars really. The, uh, the uncertainty of China's trajectory and the, and the complexity of the relationship. David? Well, I think one of the reasons you tend to have problems early on, Reagan had problems, and then George Bush the first had uh, Tiananmen. Uh, then George W. Bush had the incident with the airplane on Hainan Island in 2001. Spike plane so it's been a there. pattern. I think it's interesting to observe, and we'll see if it stays true. But thus far, uh, President Obama's administration's had a relatively smooth transition. Anything can change. Do you think the legacy of the relationship on both sides actually has something to do with making it difficult to manage? In the United States, there are many, many Americans who still perceive China as an enemy in the very, you know, old-fashioned sense of being an enemy, and they think about Vietnam and the Vietnam era and all of that, um, and the communist revolution and so on. And maybe in China as well, uh, the perception of the United States as being the enemy with all those years of propaganda that were disseminated. So is there a legacy thing, and is there anything we can do about that? There, I think legacy plays into it, and, and in particular, it tends to inform our campaigns in, in sometimes unhelpful ways, because a lot of those issues are seized upon in the course of campaigning for, presidents, for the presidency, and candidates often adopt a harder line during the campaign, and then they're sort of saddled with that when they come into government. So we've seen uh, several administrations have to do a little bit of tacking back after they come into office. But yeah, I think the history uh, informs our campaigns, informs the rhetoric as people are running for office. And then we're stuck with that, uh, that challenge of trying to move things back to a, to a more sober place. You want to add something? Well, I, I very much agree with that and only would add that the Chinese, of course, as you suggested, have their own legacy. And that was People's Republic 60 years ago. Uh, was founded, and uh, the United States uh, initiated a policy for good reasons, uh, containment policy. And the Chinese to this day still believe there's a hidden strategic um, inclination in the United States to contain and slow down China's growth in order to maintain its dominant position. And that combined with the textbooks that the Chinese uh, ch school children are educated with certainly uh, uh, creates an environment of, of what I would call mutual 
strategic suspicion, and I think that's one of the most central problems we have in our relationship. I want to talk with you about China's military position in the world at the moment, but let's turn to some of our other experts that we spoke with at Great Decisions uh, before coming to this program, see what they have to say first. With respect to um, China's military development,